Have you heard the strange tales of the whistler? was too real. This is what I've been afraid of. I know you don't believe me. You, you think I'm insane, both of you. Friday night and CBS presents The Whistler. I, The Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the weird story of the Avengers. In the great southwest, a range of high mountains extends as far as the eye can see. This is mining country, silver and gold. Halfway down the mountain is a tiny village, the mining town of Rainbow, a raucous sort of place composed of a number of stores, many saloons and the federal land office where the fortune hunters file their claims. Fifteen years ago, Rainbow was a rip-roaring village. And in a back room of the Crystal Palace Bar, a young man and a young woman hold an earnest conversation. Tell me, Miss Martin, how long have you been in this town? Oh, about two years. Came here from Kansas City. And you know my brother, John Maddox? Well, I certainly do. How well do you know him? Hmm, well enough. He came out here a year ago, and he's been hiding out up on the mountainside ever since. Got a cabin up there. Prospecting, of course. Who isn't? How well do you know him? Oh, he used to come into town quite often. I got acquainted with him in here. First, I fell for him in a big way, but he seemed to resent it. Finally, he gave me the cold shoulder. Well, he has a wife and a five-year-old daughter back east. Mm, That's what he said, but I didn't believe him. He's a bit nutty, isn't he? Nutty? No, I wouldn't say nutty. He's a smart boy. He's an engineer. Graduate of the State School of Mines. He is? Well, what's he doing here, living like a hermit? I wonder. So he gave you the cold shoulder, huh? He certainly did. Well, John is an educated mineralogist. He came out here to make a strike. And if anyone does, he should be that one. Maybe he's located a vein of ore. What do you have on your mind, Mr. Maddox? Well, I thought maybe you'd seen him visiting the Sayers office a little more often than usual. And what if I have? Or the land office? Go on, Mr. Maddox. Well, I wouldn't be interested in knowing the activities of an ordinary prospector. But a graduate mining engineer like John... Well, he may have a lead on something good. Yes. And I thought, that is, I heard, you might be more or less familiar with his activities. That's right. And, I am. And maybe you'd like to uh, come in with me. What do you mean? You know where he's been working. You know the area he's most interested in, so if you let me know, I'll beat him to it. We'll split. Split? That's right. How about it? Sure. Why not? You know, I think I'm going to like you, Mr. Maddox. Frank is the name, now. All right, Frank. This is it. He has found a spot. It didn't mean much to me until now, but he's been working on the same location for a week or more. I'm sure he's hit something. Good. That's all I wanted to know. I'll just drop in and surprise him. (laughs) See you later, Melba. See you later, partner. And so that night, John Maddox is working on some maps and papers. The meager lamp throws a dim light about the room. For an hour, he sits at the table. Then suddenly, the silence is shattered by a sound from the kitchen. Who's there? Come out of there. Come on. What are you doing here? What do you want? Nothing. How long have you been in that kitchen? Why? So you're the little thief that's been stealing my things, huh? What are you after this time? Nothing. I know who you are. You're Tony Watson. So what? Just this. You're the one who pinched my camera, my binoculars. Yes, and several other things. I didn't know. And I'm turning you over to the sheriff right now. Sheriff? No, I didn't take him. I didn't. I didn't steal anything, but... But what? I know who did. Well, you little liar. You're the one. And believe me, you're caught on the job this time, and I'll... Uh, uh, Just a minute. Sheriff. I didn't. I didn't. Hey, hey, come back here. Why, that little devil... Just a second. Well? Hello, John. Frank. 
That's right. Your brother Frank himself. Come in. What do you want? What are you doing here? Oh, just dropped in town. Thought I'd see how you were doing. Getting along all right. But you might like to hear about your wife and your daughter. Is that why you came here? Your wife is very well. Your daughter's just five years old today. I'm still wondering how you're getting along and when you're going to send for them. I know all about that. I'm going to send for them very soon. Are you? All going to live in this little shack? Certainly not. There's something a lot better by the time they arrive. Will you? Oh. Didn't have a dime when you left. Yeah, thanks to you and your lies. I know who's responsible for father's cutting me off with only a dollar. You. Have you struck pay dirt here, John? No. Hmm. What are all these interesting papers and maps on the table? Nothing. Oh, but they must mean something. Get away from that table. Let them alone. Put up your hands and stand if back. you touch those papers... Get back there. Uh-huh. Interesting. So you have struck something. All ready to be recorded. Frank, if you dare, I'll kill you. Why do you think I came here? Oh, you Don't dirty... worry. I'll settle up later. I'll see you get a share. My wife and my daughter, Doreen, they haven't a cent. I've not been able to give them anything in months. You can't do this. Do what? You put those papers down, Frank, or I'll break your dirty neck. You'd better stay where you are. Oh, no, I'll kill you first. I'll kill you. John, you're crazy. Keep back. Keep away. You crazy fool. I told you I'd shoot. You're, you're the fool, Frank. You're the fool. You won't get away with this. I'll see to that. You'll pay, Frank. I'm not through with you yet. You and everyone and everything you hold dear will, will be taken away. You will pay it back, Frank. To me and, and mine. If, if I have to climb out of my grave. John. John. Frank stands for a moment, then stuffs the papers and maps into his pocket and rushes to the door and into the night. A few seconds later, a face, a face at the window, disappears and suddenly reappears through the back door. And a boy stands looking at the inert figure on the cabin floor. Huh. Serves him right. He won't tell the sheriff anything about me now. Fifteen years have passed. And now the little mining village of Rainbow is a thriving city of mines and smelters. And the richest mine of all is the one owned by Frank Maddox. And Frank Maddox rules the city. Frank is married now and has a child, a girl of five. The child has been ill for days. And tonight, as Frank Maddox steps to the door, his wife meets him with a strange, vacant stare. Melba, what's happened? How is she? She's... She's... Oh, Frank... Frank. All those doctors, and they couldn't save her. No. They said she didn't have a chance. They did their best. Fools, what good are they? What are they paid for? They don't even know what was wrong with her. No, Frank. But, well, whatever it was, it was horrible. She she died in agony. Specialists. I told them they could name their own price. The sky was the limit. Well, it didn't seem to make any difference. Oh, the poor little thing. The poor baby. It didn't seem to be anything serious at first. It was just a week ago... She was sitting at her desk, drawing pictures, and then all of a sudden she started to gasp for breath and fell to the floor and faint. Yes, yes, I know. And then she lapsed into a coma. Oh, Frank. Frank, what was it? Why? Well, I only... couldn't think. What is it? I... I... I can't get my breath. Here, drink this. I... Frank, I didn't want to tell you, but I'm frightened. I've had it for several hours. It's just like the baby. The same thing. The baby and now you. I know what it is. It's him. It's John. John? Your brother? Yes, I knew this was going to happen. John told me. But John's dead. The night the baby took sick, I saw him in a dream. He told me something was going to happen to us, and last night I saw him again. He was grinning and laughing. He told me that... Told you what? He told me that he'd finally reached through to me, that he'd finally made contact. That's crazy. He said tomorrow would be a sad day for me. Today. But it's a dream. I know, I know, but he, he said something else. He said that now his wife was dead, that the sooner I made things right with his daughter, Doreen, the better. Frank, that's nonsense. No, no, there must be something to it. I'll find the girl. I'll, I'll get her down here. I'll try to fix things up. Maybe, maybe that'll stop all this. Frank, please, please use your head. It was a dream. I've got to find that girl. I'll, I'll send Anthony to find her. I'll explain the whole thing to him. He can find her. But why tell him about it? Well, he's my assistant. I confide in him. He'll find her. Very well, then. Tell Anthony. Tell him to find her and bring her here. Because if you... Frank. Melba. 
No, but darling... Please find that girl. Doreen. Frank Maddox carries his stricken wife to her room and calls the doctor. The next day, he explains, in a way, to his young assistant, Anthony Watson. Anthony rushes to the east to locate Doreen Maddox, and needless to say, he does. Before she knows what it's all about, she's aboard the train with young Anthony. Didn't you even know you had an Uncle Frank? Oh, yes, of course. But I didn't know much about him. When did your mother die, Doreen? Five years ago. She, um... Well... She committed suicide. What became of your father? Oh, he went west to prospect for gold or silver or something. But he got into trouble. Someone shot him, and that's all I know about it. Has your Uncle Frank ever offered to help you? No, not that I know of. Mother never mentioned it, if he did. He's a very rich man, you know, and, as I've told you, very ill. Ill? Well, he's sort of mentally ill, as well as physically. Oh? Doreen, are you... That is... Well, a girl as lovely as you should be engaged or in love. <laughs> but I'm not. You're not? Really? No. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> I can't believe it. Well, it's the truth, whether you believe it or not. Oh, I believe you. And, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. So you see, Doreen, I'd completely lost track of you. I wondered about you and your mother since the tragic death of your father. Mother died several years ago, Uncle. Yes, I should have attempted to locate you long ago. Should you? Yes, you're my brother's child. It was my duty to look after you. See that you want for nothing. Oh, but I've been getting along all right. I've not been well, Doreen. I've been quite ill lately. I've been terribly upset, my nerves. Perhaps and... you've been working too hard. No, no, it isn't that. Doreen, I, I'd like you to stay here. Make this your home. I have a check for you, a little present, $5,000. No, please, Uncle, that isn't necessary. You must accept it, Doreen, you must. I don't need it. I'll be glad to stay here with you until you're better. But really, I, I don't know what I'd do with 5000 I'd feel better if you accepted it. And perhaps your father would... Father would what? Doreen, I must tell you, I've got to tell you, it's, it's driving me mad. John is trying to, to kill me. Oh. Uncle, father's been dead for years. I know, I know, but he died hating me. Hating you? He blamed me for his having been cut off with only a dollar in our father's will. But he was wrong, and well, now he's trying to kill me. Oh, I can't believe such a thing. I have horrible nightmares. John appears to me, always threatening me. He came to me the night my little daughter became ill, and then after she died. He came again when my wife was stricken and said that after she was gone, it would be my turn. But that's just your imagination, Uncle. Well... Get it out of your mind. I can't. I'm afraid to go to sleep. You only see him in your dreams? Yes, but each time he comes nearer, closer, more real. Oh, it isn't just imagination. I'm afraid that one of these days I'll... I'll see him when I'm not asleep. And you think my being here will help matters? Is that it? Yes. If he knows you're here, that I'm taking care of you and have your welfare at heart, perhaps... Well, perhaps he'll let me alone. Prove to him that he judged you wrongly? Yes. I must make him understand. I, I can't go on this way. I'm a physical wreck. I'm, a, I'm afraid my mind will snap. I understand, Uncle. I'll try to help you. But you must try to get this off your mind. Yes, yes, I'll try. You'd better go to bed now, Uncle. Please, take the check. Very well. Good night. An hour passes. And in spite of himself, Frank drops into a fretful sleep. He moans and tosses about. And as usual, he dreams of John again. Sees him come through the wall and stand in the center of the room. You won't get away with it, Frank. Everything and everyone you hold dear will be taken away. You'll pay it back, Frank. To me and mine. No. No. Let me alone. Anthony. Doreen. Doreen! <laughs> Uncle! Uncle, what is it? What's happened? Doreen, he, he was here just now. I saw him. I, I heard him laughing. But, Mr. Maddox, that isn't possible. I heard him, I tell you. You could hear his laugh all over the house. But I heard nothing, Uncle. Not a sound. I woke up, I tell you. I heard him. But, Uncle, you must have been dreaming. Well, I haven't been asleep since I left you. I've been reading. I didn't hear a sound. You? 
You didn't hear anything, really? No, not a sound. You, Anthony? I heard nothing. You were just dreaming. Oh, no, it was too real. This is what I've been afraid of. I know you don't believe me. You think I'm insane. Uncle, please. Yes, maybe I am. Come, Anthony. No, no, Doreen. Don't go, don't go, please. But, Uncle, there's nothing I can do. It's up to you. You must convince yourself that it's all imagination. Good night, Uncle. And then the next night comes, and Frank dreams again the same frightful dream. John appears, repeats the same words, and laughs in the same way. Frank is wide awake now, shaking with fear, and all the while trying to convince himself that it's only his imagination. Then the bedroom door opens suddenly. Doreen steps into the room. Her face is white with fear. She trembles as she moves slowly toward the bed. Uncle. Uncle. Doreen, what is it? What's wrong? Uncle, I... Just now, I heard something. What? Doreen, what did you hear? I must have been dreaming. I must have. But it was so clear. Your father? Yes. Yes, I heard him. And he was laughing. Then if you heard him, it must be true. He has come back. Oh, did you hear it too? Yes. Yes, he was here in this room. What did he say to you? I, I can't remember. I, I was so frightened. But I heard him. And that laughed. Now you believe me. Now, now you know I'm not imagining things. Oh, also, I don't know. I, I'm so frightened. I don't know what to think. I can't stay here any longer. I've got to leave. I can't stay another night. Oh, Doreen, please. Don't go. Not yet. I promise that you'll stay t- just a while longer. Please. But, Uncle, I... All right, I'll try. I'll stay. Then comes the next night, another dreadful night of horror. Frank tries his best to control his mounting fear as evening passes and midnight comes. He fights sleep, the sleep that brings him nothing but horrifying dreams and the voice of John. But finally, he can hold out no longer, and his eyes close. A half hour goes by, then... Frank. Frank. You're not asleep, Frank. You're wide awake, and this is real. John, what do you want? Tell me, I'll do it. I'll do anything. I told you you'd pay. Everything and everyone dear to you would be taken away. At this very moment, your wife is dying, Frank. First your daughter, now your wife. And then you. John, please, please don't do anything. Then sit down at that table and write. Write a will. Everything to the one it belongs to. My daughter, Doreen. Yes, yes, I'll do it. And a confession, Frank. Confession? A confession that you came to my cabin that night and killed me. Oh, no, I can't, John. You can and you will. They'll, they'll hang me. They won't hang you. No? So write the will and the confession. Yes, but I'm afraid that... They won't hang you. Because in just one minute, you will be dead. Oh, no, hurry, no. Frank. You haven't much time to save your soul. You're going to have a stroke, Frank. In just a minute, you'll feel a sudden beating of your temples. A stroke is what they'll call it. And you'll be dead. Hurry. Yes. All right, it. I will. Your conscience will be clear, Frank. And that'll be best for you, I know. I said I'd reach you if I had to crawl out of my grave. There, there it is. Now, please leave me alone, Frank. Please, please. Too late, Frank. You're going back with me. Look at the clock. Fifteen seconds left. Now it's starting. Your head is beginning to whirl. Strange sounds beat in your ears. Faster. Faster. Do you hear? Yes, yes. Please don't, John. Five seconds. There it is. You're dying, Frank. This is the end. The end of Frank Maddox. No, 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 John. John. No, no, no. Doreen, what's happened? I heard him screaming. Anthony, I think he's... Feel his pulse. I... I can't find it. Not a trace. Anthony, is he... I don't know. He's had a stroke, I think. I'll call the doctor. Yes, I'll have to go after him. His car is out of order. Come on. It may be too late for the doctor, but we'd better get him anyway. Use this phone and tell him I'll be there in a few minutes. Here, 
there, Doctor? What happened to him? I think he had a stroke. Hmm. Uh, a stroke, eh? Well. Hmm. We heard him screaming, and when we got here, he was unconscious. Well, he's dead. But he didn't have a stroke. What? You can see for yourself. He's been stabbed in the heart. You don't need me. You want the police. You say, miss, that you heard your uncle screaming? I did. What did it seem to be, a scream of pain? No, no, I couldn't make out what it was. But it sounded as though he was horribly frightened. It seemed as though he was pleading with someone. Did you hear him, Anthony? Yes, it sounded just as Doreen said, as though someone or something were after him. What do you mean by something? Well, I just use that as a form of expression. And when you reached him, he was on the floor, unconscious? That's right. Was he dead? We didn't know. I couldn't find any pulse, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. That's why I went for the doctor. And you didn't notice the knife wound in his chest? No. Did you see it, miss? No. It may have been there, but I didn't notice it. Are you sure he didn't have a stroke, doctor? Positive. He may have had a collapse, fainted, but there was no stroke. He died from this stab in the heart. What sort of instrument would you say was used? Well, I'd say a long, thin knife about a half inch wide. Like a letter opener? Yes, sort of a stiletto. Doctor, had you been treating Mr. Maddox lately for any particular ailment? Well, I've been attending him frequently of late. What was troubling him? I don't know. Oh, you don't know. Are you sure? Well, I couldn't find any definite physical trouble, but he was becoming terribly run down. Seemed to get worse each day. He couldn't eat nor sleep. Extremely nervous. Hypertension. I gave him sedatives and tonics, but they seemed to do no good, so I finally came to the conclusion that it was mental. Mental? What do you mean? I think he had developed some sort of phobia, a fear. What I was never able to determine. In time, it would have resulted in insanity and finally death. Or perhaps a stroke and death. But in this case, it was not a stroke. You've been attending his wife? Yes. What is her ailment? Carcinoma. But she doesn't know it. There's nothing more I can do for her, except alleviate the pain. Miss Maddox, from the tone of your uncle's screams, would you say that there was some person in the room with him at the time? Yes, and no. Yes and no? What does that mean? I mean, he may have thought someone was here with him. May have thought someone was with him? Yes, that is... Well, from all appearances, there was someone with him. The someone who stabbed him. Anthony, was Miss Maddox in this room when you came in? No, we met in the hall and came in together. Uh, neither of you saw the knife wound. I'm sure I didn't. Doreen, you just said that he may have thought someone was here in this room. What do you mean? Well, he was afraid of... Afraid of what? Afraid of who? Afraid of my father. What? Why, your father's been dead 15 years. Yes, yes, but that's just it. I may as well tell you. He was afraid my father was trying to kill him. That's what was wrong with him. Why he couldn't sleep. Oh, gosh. Now it's spooks. No, no. He said that father appeared to him every night and threatened him. Threatened him? Well, all right, so we threatened him. Why? He said father hated him, that father thought Uncle Frank had caused him to lose his inheritance. Well, Doctor, do you think that's what was wrong with Frank? Could have been. Quite possible. All right, I'll grant you that. But no spook produced that knife wound. Doreen, do you believe that your father lost his inheritance because of your uncle? No. No, I do not. Are you sure? I'm sure father did not lose his part of the estate because of Uncle Frank. Are you sure? Could you prove that? Well, no, no, I couldn't. I never heard Father mention it. I never heard him accuse Uncle Frank. What brought you here? My uncle sent for me. Why? Because he was afraid of my father. He thought my being here might help matters. That's right, Captain. He sent me for Doreen. I located her and brought her here. Oh, me. Oh, my. This gets worse and worse. You know all about it, too, did you? Yes. Mr. Maddox confided in me. He had the idea that if Doreen were brought here and he showed good intentions toward her, that John would leave him alone. Oh, poor John. What a busy guy. It isn't funny. You said it. Frank Maddox has been murdered, and it wasn't a spook. I know who did it, and I know why. What are you talking about? Frank Maddox didn't send for her. She came here of her own accord, and for a definite reason. She did not. I brought her here. You're lying. You're trying to cover up for her. I am not. Because you're in love with her. Anybody can see that. Well, what if I am in love with him? That doesn't have anything to do with this. Frank Maddox sent me for her. He did not. She knew that Frank was the cause of her father losing his inheritance. So she came here to kill him, and she did. Well, that doesn't make sense. Why would she kill him? What would she gain by that? Have a hair of revenge. If it hadn't been for Frank, her father would have been wealthy, and so would she. But she didn't know about her father's accusations until Frank Maddox told her himself. Oh, then you admit that she does know about it now. I knew nothing about it until Uncle Frank told me. But I still think father was wrong. Whether you knew about it before you came here or learned it after you got here, what's the difference? It's a motive. You stabbed him. You left the room, and then you met Anthony in the hall. You stuck Miss Maddox, and you haven't a chance. Wait. Wait a minute. Mrs. Maddox, don't come in here. And why not? Why shouldn't I come in here? You shouldn't get up. You, well, you should... I know. I know all about it. 
I know what's happened. I've heard every word. You're... You're very ill, Mrs. Maddox. I know. I heard you. And now I know what's wrong with me. I know what carcinoma is, doctor. Please go back to bed. No. No, not just yet. I... Well, this girl, Doreen, you're wrong. She's innocent. She had nothing to do with it. That is, not directly. What do you mean, Mrs. Maddox? She didn't kill Frank. I did. You? She's perfectly innocent. Frank did send for her. He was afraid of John. He dreamed about him every night. He did think John was trying to reach him from, from the grave, trying to kill him. It was his imagination, I know, but he really believed it. And he had a good reason to believe it. What reason? I've heard Frank moaning and yelling for weeks and weeks. I heard him tonight. I came in here and found him on the floor. He'd made a will. This paper. Leaving everything to Doreen and explaining why. Oh. Sit down, Melba. Yes. Well, he came out of his faint. And I found this will. I went wild when I saw it. He tried to get it away from me. He said it had to be that way. We struggled for it. And I took the paper knife and stabbed him. I went back to my room, but I've been standing outside the door. I heard everything. Particularly what you said about me, Doctor. So what does it matter? This girl is innocent. What is this paper? Let's see it. I'll tell you what it says. It leaves everything Frank has to Doreen. And the reason why? Frank killed John. What? Yes. It was all my fault. I knew John had made a strike, and I told Frank about it. Frank went to John's cabin and killed him, took the maps and the papers and filed an acclaim. I was the one responsible for everything. But it all rightfully belongs to Doreen. And now... Well, now that I've heard the doctor's sentence... What does it matter? Well, Doreen, that was lucky for you. Lucky that Melba was standing outside the door and heard the doctor. But oh, what I know about you, Doreen. You and Anthony. Anthony did bring you down here. But on the way, he fell madly in love with you. He told you about your uncle's fears. And so between the two of you, you decided to make his dreams more than real. Anthony arranged a little radio speaker in Uncle Frank's room. Yes, it was Anthony who spoke to Frank. Not John's voice from the grave. Anthony merely amplified Frank's dreams, yes. You and Anthony plan to work on Frank psychologically in order to get that will and the confession. But how did Anthony know the exact words to use? The words John used when he was dying that night in the cabin? Why, because Anthony was the little boy John caught in his cabin that night. The boy who heard every word said between Frank and John. The smart little boy who saw it all. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time, I, The Whistler, will return to tell you another unusual tale. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.